thank you for having us. I've got the great honor um, today to interview Jan Winhall, who I'd like to present. Jan is a Toronto-based focusing-oriented psychotherapist and a trainer who's working on a book due out next June. Welcome, Jan. Thank you. Um, you know, your model starts with an embodied approach to addiction, which is so fascinating. Could you tell us how you got here? Big, big, long 40 year journey. Mm -hmm. um, and you know some of that journey, Anne. So I was thinking about it. I went for a walk before we uh, started this morning and realized that I think the, this, this knowing place that addiction really is so much about what happens in the body. Um, and that we, in our culture, you know, we live a very top-down life. And those of us here in the Embodiment Conference are probably all really resonating with that, that we're looking for these ways of being able to be connected to ourselves in an embodied way. And I think I always knew that addiction was probably the best understood in terms of being able to go into and connect with what happens actually in the body during this state. And, and I think as I, as I was walking, I was thinking more about how that really started for me, because I usually tell the story that it, it started when I was working um, fresh out of graduate school with a, a group of young women who were incest survivors. And this was an incredible experience. Um, and really made me, it reinforced even more how much addiction happens in the body and that it, it, it isn't a disease. It has to do with the nervous system. But as I was walking this morning, I realized more that I really knew that in my own body from my own experience as a teenager, when um, I had what, what I guess we would call now a relationship addiction. Um, things were kind of falling apart in my family. Uh, I was kind of feeling very un, untethered. And I, I fell in love, this kind of first love when you're 16, you know, in the, in the summer. And it was very exciting. But then it quickly turned into um, a, a kind of experience of panic attacks where um, this poor guy that I was smothering to death would retreat and I would go into full bone panic. And then my experience was that if I could get him to come back quickly, so the way that I would settle that panic inside was to reach out to this relationship to soothe me. And it worked. In the moment, it helped me. But what I realized in my, my, my definition of addiction, in the moment it helped me, but, and it felt good, but then it began to really harm me because I realized I was, I was stuck. I was totally dependent on another human being to help me with this horrible panicky feeling. And I couldn't stop, the, I couldn't stop that cycle. So I was in full-blown addiction. So how did I get out of that? I got out of it through finding a way to soothe myself that didn't involve something external. I got myself into psychotherapy. And I learned how to ground myself inside me. So from that place, I came, you know, young, uh, clinical social worker into this group with these women who were, as I listened, I, I, I never bought into this pathologizing model because I, I knew that that wasn't right, that you could work your way through this, that addiction wasn't a brain disease that stayed with you forever because mine didn't. And as I listened to these young women who were being so pathologized in the hospital system, realizing, you know, these are women who are victims of, of violence, of trauma. They aren't psychiatric patients. And yet, of course, they were struggling. 
But back then we had this wonderful feminist analysis that has just stayed with me of understanding what was going on there in terms of, of what we called flooding and numbing. And flooding was that panicky sympathetic response and the numbing was the, the shutting down. And what I saw in how they were responding when I listened to what they were doing, they were, they were drinking, they were acting out sexually, they were doing things like cutting their bodies, eating bars of soap, things that I, I didn't understand. But when I really listened to them, I heard that it helped them. It brought this sense of numbing and soothing. And so that really stayed with me. Um, and I went on a, a kind of a, um, a hunt over the years, a quest to try to figure out more about what that was. So early days, you know, we, we read Trauma and Recovery, Judith Herman's wonderful work. She talked about this too. She saw what she described as these kind of jolts in the body that signaled a shift, which shifts, shifts us from this kind of flight fight place down into numbing or the other way back up from a dead and numb place into flooding. Right. And Bessel van der Kolk also talked about this a lot. Um, so then what I did is I started to, to look for a therapy that I could use that would work with, with women in the body. Because I realized that I wasn't going to get there from doing this top down, discussing what happened. And who wants to discuss all these horrible things that happened that should never have happened to anybody? Um, what you, you were very knowing. I knew in my body. Mm -hmm. You know, I think um, we know we're connected to our bodies when we're born. Mm -hmm. But our culture just splits us, right? Yes. It splits us in this terrible kind of way. So I went hunting and I found a, a, a process called focusing. And I want to take us in with our audience too. I want to take us through this process so that you get a sense of how it works in the body. So I'm going to do it with you, lead with you, Anne, and the people that are joining us and with us. I hope that you'll settle yourselves in your seat and this is not a triggering process you know when we talk about addiction we, we the body goes up into an anxious place but this process we're going to do with focusing with going inside um, in this particular practice we're going to look for a calm place inside or something that feels okay inside it doesn't have to be perfect and that's a place where we're going to start and then i'll explain the model with polyvagal theory and then we'll do another practice at the end. Sound good? Sounds okay. wonderful. Okay. So Anne is a, a budding focusing oriented therapist and a focusing trainer. Focusing comes from Gene Gendlin's work. He was a student of Carl Rogers. And he discovered that when people did well in therapy, working on deep stuff and trauma stuff, they were connected to their bodies. Surprise, surprise. And so focusing is, is not a method, it's a natural process in the body that I believe it, this, this shifts that happen in the body are shifts in the nervous system. So this is where polyvagal theory comes in. And Jenlin saw these shifts, as, as did Carl Rogers. He called them uh, moments of movement. So beautiful. So we're gonna start by closing your eyes or, or just softening your gaze and just feeling your feet on the floor. And slowly and gently, just kind of like the leaves that are now falling in Toronto from the trees, 
just watching your attention fall down somewhere into the center of your body. And notice how it is in your body right now. Mine's a little bit on the sympathetic adrenaline end because I'm here doing this workshop and I usually get a bit of that in the beginning. And just notice where you are. Is it a little bit excited or maybe a little bit kind of dull and flattened in there? It's checking to see. And notice where you feel it in your body. Lots of times we get lots of information down in the belly or up through the stomach and the lungs, the center of the body. And then what I invite you to do is just invite in an experience in your life, a moment. Nothing doesn't have to be anything big. Just a little moment that feels okay. Feels like you're okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just feel okay. You might describe it as grounded or it feels okay. Doesn't have to be perfect. And notice where that sits in your body. Yeah, it's right in my belly. <clears throat> so right deep in my belly. Deep in your belly. And would there be a word or an image or maybe a gesture in the body that really captures the essence of this place. All the thoughts and the feelings and the physical sensations and the memories, all those four kind of avenues into this felt sense. And then we're just looking around for a handle for this something that you could kind of hold on to, grab a hold of again, if you wanted to really resource this place of feeling okay in your body. For me, it's sweet honey. Sweet honey. Beautiful. Very golden. Ooh. Really golden. Really golden, sweet honey. Right. Beautiful. So you've got your handle for this felt place. And in a little while, when we go back in to work on uh, something more uncomfortable, possibly, you can use this as a resource. Sweet honey. Thank you. So there's an example of how we would use a felt sense to anchor when we would need to. But what Chandler noticed in these um, recordings of psychotherapy over time was that people would have these kind of shifts in the body when they would stay inside with the whole felt sense, the meaning that's in there that is carried in your body. And this is what I noticed in the women's group was that there were these places where the body would shift and they would really change their whole kind of demeanor. Mm -hmm. And I think we all in a sense know these places, right? Where you might be really anxious and upset about something and then something comes that where you're able to listen to this place inside and there's a shift where the body releases a little bit and feels better. Maybe you go talk to a good friend. You don't have to make it a, a big focusing session. It can be just, this is how we live our lives. Our bodies respond in the autonomic nervous system all the time. So I'm gonna share a screen.
the way that we work with the felt sense. I'm a very visual person, so my work is very visual. So these are body cards that we use that one of our, our focusing trainers, Annette Dubray, uh, came up with this idea. And it really was so powerful for all of us that we, we just never went back to just kind of writing about it. Um, mo many people will use writing, as you can see, we delineate thoughts, memories. This is where we work with the trauma part of addiction, right? Uh, the feelings that come and the physical sensations. And you can see that, you know, a lot of people now in the therapy world are talking about the felt sense. But I find that a lot of the time, what they're talking about is physical sensation. But this is, this is only one part of the felt sense. The felt sense in the body carries meaning. And when we stay with it and we listen to what's going on in there, the body creates these felt shifts. So this is an example of a body card in a state of flooding. So we're gonna go back to, here's the model that I put together. This is the clinician model. It's complicated. This I created for clients. This is basically the autonomic nervous system. So as I progressed in this kind of adventure of trying to figure out what was going on uh, with myself and with these young women in the group and with addiction, with self-harm and addiction, these self-harming behaviors, not all of them became addictive, but a lot of them did. What I began to realize was in the, the first kind of layer of understanding, here was the flooding place of flight fight, and here was the freeze place, um, uh, of uh, the numbing place that we use, we would talk about in the early days. And this is the grounded place. So then as I moved along in understanding what was, what was going on, I learned about a new um, uh, kind of uh, development, new theory called interpersonal neurobiology, which has become very popular now, beautiful, wonderful work. And I realized that uh, Dan Siegel, Bonnie Badenock, I did some training with her, and um, that where, where Dan was, they were talking about chaos over here in the flight fight place of the nervous system and rigidity down here in fawn and freeze. So I began to really get more of a sense of understanding the neurobiology, the autonomic nervous system, and how it plays out in these felt shifts that happen in the body. So what I was doing was layering this kind of neurobiological understanding of the body in the autonomic nervous system, the part of the body that watches out to see whether we're safe or we're not safe. And I layered that with a focusing practice so that we're integrating subjective experiencing with science, which is very much what uh, interpersonal neurobiology is about as well. Although they talk about different kinds of practices um, like in the mindsight wor world, but a lot of focusing really overlays and integrates into these practices very nicely. So then we had, you know, this, this uh, inter state of integration and then the state of the sympathetic uh, chaotic place and over here the parasympathetic fawning, pleasing behavior and freeze behavior. And I worked with that for quite a while and wrote a chapter in a book that uh, Bonnie Badenock very generously helped uh, edit. And then as time went on, um, I went to another conference and heard Steve Porges. And I realized when I was listening to this, that what I, what I was, so in polyvagal theory, let's back up a bit. What the big thing that happened there in polyvagal theory was uh, Steve Porges naming of this initially frozen uh, numb place 
uh, in this dissociated place that we all know about as trauma therapists, uh, he named this as this second branch of the vagus in the autonomic nervous system, the dorsal vagus. So he brought into the autonomic nervous system the dissociated state and named it as such, which had not been done before in the ways that people conceptualize the autonomic nervous system. And this was huge for us as trauma therapists because it really gave us a way of understanding what's going on in the nervous system when we see our clients numbing. And so what came for me from that was an understanding of what addiction is. So I see addictions, this place of fixate here, as a propeller that intertwines this flight fight sympathetic response and the fawn freeze dorsal response. And what that looks like when you're in that subjective experience is um, I'm freaking out, I'm in full blown panic. I do what I need to do. I find that relationship guy or I drink myself into oblivion or I cut myself or whatever it is that I need to do that I've learned will release opioids and lots of other dopamine and whatever that will then move me into this numb state so that I can cope with my life. Because I don't know how to settle myself down here in this integrated ventral part of the vagus nerve. And this is from polyvagal theory. So to make it simple, because it, it can be simple, it can be really complex. I call this version, the client version, the six Fs. So we have the flight fight place here that we know about, the sympathetic place. We have this fixate place of addiction and we have fawn freeze that numbs us. And in addiction, in trauma, we live up here in this upper part of the cycle. This is where marginalized folks live. This is where trauma lives. This is where addiction lives. Up here. And you can see that in this state, what we're missing are all these places in the bottom half of the model where the autonomic nervous system thrives in safety, enough safety, because no place is safe. If we ever knew that, we know it now with COVID. None of us are safe. But we have to look for these little moments, these little places in the body that bring us back to some measure of moments of safety. So down here in flock, I called this flock because this is part of the sweet spot of feeling grounded, feeling safe enough, feeling regulated in the body. And it's part of what in Porges uh, polyvagal theory is where the social engagement system is. So this part of the vagus nerve that brings so much information about our bodies, 80% of the information about our bodies comes up through the vagus nerve. And this part of the of the, um, the social engagement system is activated up from above the diaphragm, in through the heart, and up into the face, and into the ear. And so when I look at Anne, and I see, oh, there's my friend, and she's smiling at me, I feel safe. I feel a sense of engagement and connection and flock, where we flock together, we come together. And this is what's so hard right now because of COVID. And so it's part of why we see so many people flying up into this state of addiction because we can't be here in the way that we normally would be. So over here, is an intertwining state in the nervous system that um, Steve Porges calls play, I believe. 
and I've called it fun in the client model. Um, just because making it six F's is helpful for ways of, for people to, to remember it. And when I work with clients, we use this a lot. We, we play with it. We notice where did we go today in the session? What's going on inside you? Fun is the combination of a little bit of sympathetic fight flight and a lot of grounding flock. And um, I think one of the best ways to understand this state is to, um, you know, remember when you've heard kids playing and they're laughing and they're having a lot of fun. And then all of a sudden somebody starts to either cry because they go into flight or kick and scream and yell and go, they go into fight. So something has happened that tips the balance and they've moved into a system of defense. So over here, we go to flow. Flow is an intertwining of this grounded place and immobilization. In polyvagal theory, they talk a lot about this immobilizing with fear over here. So you're, you're stuck, you're shut down, you can't escape. But here in flow, it's an intertwining in the nervous system of a grounded flock place and safety in being still. And Steve talks about being safe in the arms of a loved one. That's flow. Our focusing practice, our meditation practices, lots of our embodied yoga practices all happen here in flow. So this is a really helpful way of understanding. So what is addiction? You know, well, it's something, it, it's connected to neuroplasticity for sure. I like um, Mark Lewis's learning model of addiction. Um, it really helps us to understand how the brain works. And the things that we can do, these neural exercises that we can do, which bring us into working, um, so yes, so this is the, the wonderful thing is that we can see the visuals here. We can see how we use our focusing practices here to help us to move down to live in this bottom part of the, of the model. So I wonder, Anne, if now would be a good time to... Um, Stop sharing screen. And maybe we could do um, going inside that's around addiction. We can just share with, with folks who are watching to see how, how we work with these shifts and states in the body, these felt sense experiences that happen in the body when we're working on, uh, on, on an issue or something that comes up in our lives. Focusing is really about that. It's, it's um, using our body's natural process as a way of guiding the direction that we need to go in healing. It's okay. a beautiful way of understanding the body's natural wise response that we don't hear when we go so quickly through our lives, especially in our Western world. So, Beautiful. yeah. So you've got lots of experiences and some changing views and experiences about your own uh, journey with addiction and how you have um, the kinds of help that you've sought out with 12 steps and then with focusing and your whole journey with the book. Yes. Seven coming, years ago. Yes, coming out in a memoir. Yeah, yeah. Telling my story. Telling your story, yeah. So how about we... We just invite you to settle in a little bit. Okay. Yeah. And thank you for doing this. 
you know, it's a journey, right? Where you're sharing something vulnerable. Yes. Yes. And I really appreciate that because it's our way of really teaching people and showing people what we do in focusing practice. Yeah. All right. So, slowing things down and settling down into your chair. And just beginning by noticing. There was lots of information that I pumped out there that most of which you know anyway, but just taking your time to let the body really savor and get a sense of what's going on inside around this whole topic of addiction, of the word addict that we've, we've spoken about, how powerful that is for you. And just where you are in your own healing journey. Maybe just notice what are the physical sensations in the body. Take your time, we have some time. I find myself very drawn to the word flock. Mm. From what, from being with the model. Mm. And I find myself getting a lot of warmth. My legs. So you feel really drawn towards this word flock and the state of warmth in your legs that comes. Yeah. Yeah, but. There's a but. But there's a but. Huh. The word addict. Mm. sits like a fish hook in my throat. Mm. Let me That's say, it. yeah, back to you. The word addict sits like a fish hook in your throat. Yes. Mm. Doesn't go up and it doesn't go down. It just sits there, really stuck. Really stuck in your throat there, not up, not down, really stuck, this word addict. It takes me back to times when I was blackout drinking, something we, you touched on earlier, when you talked about addiction and I feel shame. Mm. So what came there was remembering the days of when you were really in the addicted place and the blackouts. Mm -hmm. And what came is shame in here, in this fish hook. Yes, it doesn't move. And it's not moving. No. And that's the... Oh, that's the big thing of the body knowing that is so different from the head knowing. And it's so different from sweet honey, <laughs> which is what I came up with earlier. 
Uh huh. So just let's notice in your body. Sweet honey is so different than the fish hook and the shame. Yes. So I really, in me, I want to speak to the shame. I, okay. I don't always do this in focusing, but I want our listeners to really get, and there's something that just wants to, to give this to you because, you know, I love you. You're my friend. And, you know, what I'm saying, the essence of my message is that addictions are adaptive. Addictions save our lives. There's nothing maladaptive about our autonomic nervous system. It can get stuck and it can get triggered and we need to update it sometimes. But it's going to that place because it can't find flock and sweet honey kept you alive. That's quite a gift. That's quite it. It makes my head dizzy, but it doesn't make my body dizzy. Okay, so let's notice that. That idea that, that addiction is adaptive. It yes. makes your head dizzy, but it doesn't make the rest of your body dizzy. No, it makes my, the rest of my body feel very soothed. Oh. Adaptive. 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 The body's natural wisdom is to shift. I think of it as like the second gear. <laughs> the first gear is like, you know, moving along in that sweet honey. But then when, when things happen, and maybe they've always happened in your life, maybe you've never known sweet honey as many people haven't. Right. Then you need another system. It's a backup plan that mm -hmm. helps you survive. Yes. I live in Sweet Honey now, but back then when I was drinking, it was like the fish hook every night. Yeah. It was like, I won't drink, I won't drink, I won't drink. Oh my gosh, the stores are going to close. I will drink. Yeah. <laughs> Every night. Yeah. Every night. And it feels softer now that you talk. Now that you've spoken, it feels... I can breathe. So let, let's maybe, would it feel safe enough to just go in there a little bit, to, go, to deepen your experiencing and take a look around, be in the throat, or maybe just walk up to it a little bit, just titrate that a bit for yourself. Right. Just, what's it like in there now when we've dropped down this word adaptive and your felt sense of sweet honey? And, you know, maybe it hasn't changed, but maybe something. It's all scarred, mm. but yeah, it's healed. It's all scarred, but it's healed. Healed. I can swallow again. <sighs> I can swallow. You can swallow again. Yeah, adaptive makes my arms radiant with shivers. Adaptive makes your arms radiant with sugars? Shivers. Shivers. <laughs> shivers. Ugh. Oh. oh, that feels different. Thank goodness you had that second plan. The backup plan. Backup plan. Right. 
Thank you. Thank you. The fish hook's gone. Hmm. Which is what is so interesting about focusing. Mm -hmm. <sighs> it speaks in metaphors. <laughs> yes. Well, this is part of the right hemisphere, right? Yes. Objective experience speaks in metaphors, pictures tell a story. The body speaks in metaphor. So there was a big felt shift that you had in your throat. Yes. And that felt shift moved you from, would you say you were when you, when you went into the, the hook, was that the flight fight place? Yes. Yes, the sympathetic branch of the nervous system, adrenaline pumping, cortisol, trauma, stress. Yeah. And then as we stayed with it in our focusing process and lots of other body processes, but the, the beauty of understanding the felt sense and the shift is that it, it just, it is a mechanism by which, or process by which the body works. And those moments of movement, I call them moments of liberation. They liberate you, your arms, your whole body moves and shifts into a different neurophysiological state. And that addiction is what propels us when we can't move into the sweet honey state of flock. And, you know, we're not saying it's all wonderful. Of course, it's horrible to be stuck in that place. The beauty of it is in our work, in our healing work, we can really help people in our practices to move into these grounding places, right? Through focusing, through yoga practice, through connecting with our friends, through flock, through falling in love, through looking at the trees, through this right now here in this moment as we can, you know, kind of see through chat, people are connecting and they're with us, right? It's so um, eloquent mm. in a really bodily way. I feel transformed. It's so eloquent uh -huh. in a bodily way, feeling this transformation. Yeah. And we have these ways of being able to track that um, through uh, Gendlin created this experiencing scale, which helps us to notice how deeply people go in the process. And the deeper we go in the process of psychotherapy, the more healing can occur in the body. Right. So we have to go to these places to heal from addiction. Addict, the underbelly of addiction is trauma. Not necessarily trauma from your mother. We're not blaming mothers. It's trauma in intergenerational trauma. It's global trauma. It's trauma that comes from systemic racism and sexism. And it's a wonderful thing in some ways what's happening now in the world is we're waking up to all of that. Yeah. Sure need our body practices. Thank you, Jan. Thank you for being willing to be vulnerable. Jendlin called this vulnerability our shaky being. <laughs> Beautiful. And there's a lot of emphasis now put on uh, people talking so much about safety. You know, in polyvagal theory, we talk about the primacy of safety, how important that, and what does that actually mean? Because when we, when we construct a lot of these theories, we construct them from a very white body supremacy place, right? Things are great in your life, it's all sweet honey, and then maybe a terrible thing happens, and then you, know, then you go back to the sweetness. But that is not the way many people live their lives. Mm. So we need to change our, our theories to be more, much more informed by how everybody in the world is living. And polyvagal theory is really teaching us that, right? 
that none of us are safe unless all of us are paying attention to the other person's safety. Right. right. What a time we're living in. Unprecedented. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think everyone's going to take your notion of flock <laughs> and how important flocking is right now. As you say, we're living in unprecedented times. Mm -hmm. And we really do need to have these communities, um, particularly embodied communities, in which we can practice, you know. So we have our community, um, the International Focusing Institute, that, you know, um, sort of the umbrella for all of our focusing community and we have our own community um, that i started uh in toronto focusing on board and and now we're all online but at least we have this availability right to to flock together here and to do our embodied practices so the fact that this conference is happening for example an embodiment conference with 400,000 people. I mean, 40 years ago when I started this work, <laughs> that was like some pipe dream. It's an incredible thing. It's an incredible thing. And incredible to actually think that we could talk about addiction and feel freed. Exactly. Free of shame. Yes, that's such a, a great question. And I write a whole chapter in, in the book about that. Because, you know, so often opposites attract. Uh, people who live more in the flight fight place will look towards people who live more in a, in a calmer, structured, sometimes more numb kind of place. And the real key there is that we get into a power struggle around that. So when I, when I work with people, I, we, we just, we bring out the model. Um, I have a big one in my office and my, my clients really uh, taught me how to really use it in a lot of ways because they, they take pictures of it on their watch and they connect with their partners and start to talk about this um, in terms of what are we doing that we need from each other because it can be a real power struggle. At first you like the difference in the person and then it really starts to bug you. Um, so being sensitive to what each other needs in terms of creating safety. Because flock, flock and flow are safety. And often when we go into flight fight, we tend to get really big and we scare the pants out of this other person who needs to really contain to feel safe. <laughs> so we have to develop these ways of really listening. Um, I have a, a, a model that I use that's in an integration of Harville, and, uh, Harville Hendricks and Helen LaKelly Hemsworth in Imago therapy. And we bring in the polyvagal dialogue to connect each person through listening practice and through understanding, through focusing practice and through understanding the autonomic nervous system, how to connect in a way that both people can have what Harville and Helen call a safe conversation. I would say to give yourselves a daily practice of asking as you slowly drop your attention down into the body and looking around for a felt sense to form inside, just simply by asking, how am I inside here today? And give yourselves a moment to pause and feel into that in your body.
emailing us and um, 